It's play-in day. Is there a way to stop LeBron James' three-point shooting the equalizer for the Pelicans? I have the Lakers' perspective from the Kamenetsky brothers in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go! You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Tuesday. It is play-in day, seven versus eight, Lakers versus Pelicans. We're breaking it down with Jake Madison of Locked on Pelicans next. You are Locked on Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, everyone, it is play in day. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky, hosts of Locked on Lakers. And I'm Jake Madison, host of Locked on Pelicans. We got a crossover episode here, the play in game. This is always fun. I love this. Right. And unlike the last time we did a crossover episode where Jake was just like too arrogant to use the content <laughs> on his channel, I don't need you people. Today, we have been promised, Andy. Uh, you know, maybe it's just because the network is mandating it. I don't know. But this this is for everyone. This is for the people in L.A. This is for the people in um, in, in, Law, in in New Orleans, uh, because it is the playoffs, I think. Kind of like, right, like stats, people put up stats that don't really count for anything technically since right. these records are like independent from everything else. But it's the post it's the postseason. OK, so I, I this is this is like one of these like important debates in the NBA that uh, that has never quite been settled. Uh, but it is the play in night. It is seven versus eight. Winner moves on to face the Denver Nuggets, which is a quite a reward. Uh, loser will play either Sacramento or Golden State on Friday. But that is a crossover <laughs> for a different day. Also, by the way, isn't necessarily that much of a treat either. I guess no. nothing else from the Lakers side who've been getting their asses beat by the Kings as much as the Nuggets. It, it just, it, it, it's, it's funny because like, here, why don't we start with this? You know, Brian and I were talking about this before we started recording. Should either of these two teams like deliberately lose this game just to avoid the Nuggets? Like you, you said it right. Like you're here's like congrats on winning. Now play Denver in the first round. I mean, we we discussed this, Jake, for Monday's show, and Brian and I were both hard no on that one. I mean, it, yes, it is not ideal to be going up against Denver, the consensus best team in the West, the best starting five, I think, in the entire league in terms of the way that they operate. But the flip side is. Do you put aside like the karmic and, you know, oh, yeah. basketball <laughs> gods, all of that stuff. The idea of the plan being going into single elimination for a playoff bid against either Steph Curry, who is on the short list for most dangerous players in the league for this type of setting or, ever, <laughs> not just yeah. today, ever, or from the Kings. I mean, I can only tell you from the Laker perspective, I don't know how the Pelicans have done against the Kings this season, but five and the Lakers, <laughs> <for the> Lakers <laughs> perspective, I mean, look, if you want to lose this game, Jake, go right <laughs> no, you're right. You're right on this though. It's, it's a terrible idea. Like I go back to the first year of the playing tournament when the Pelicans got in and they were on the road playing the Clippers and Paul George is ruled out with COVID, right? Like they were a big favorite. If Paul George plays, they probably win in a one game winner go home scenario like you just can't risk it fluky things happen right you can't run like run the risk of something that you don't control at all coming into play or Steph Curry getting hot or whatever you just don't want to mess with something like that so I think both these teams are going to try and actively win this game well it's funny too is like you, know, you feel like from New Orleans perspective like the Lakers the benefit for the Lakers the biggest benefit obviously of the the seven eight jumping up to the eight is that you know, you have a chance to get in just on one game. That's, I mean, 
Dumb, it's huge. It's a thinking. huge, it's a huge difference, right? Like yeah. you, all you need to do, you get a mulligan essentially, right? You right. lose this one. Cool. You can go on and play the next one and still get in. Having to only win one game versus two in a row is there's like a it's massive huge. difference there. And for the Lakers too, that, that backup plan, like if it's, it's okay, like if you end up in that other game, it's okay. Like, you know, but you don't do it on purpose, but the other benefit for the Lakers is that you get to play that second game at home. What I find yeah. fascinating about new Orleans is like, it was like not only would you tank the first game to avoid uh, Denver in the first round, you then would have to offer to go on the road to play. <laughs> like we, we want to get into that other game, but why don't you guys host it? Because we're so bad at home that we'd be five hundred basically. Road. Yeah, it's it's weird, right? Like you know, it, I was talking to someone else about home court advantage with this, and I think it's really interesting that this is the matchup coming off the heels of the game at the end of the regular season, right? The Lakers just stayed in New Orleans. They they didn't need to get on a plane. They're getting a good night's rest, right? They're gonna have some like time to relax a little bit that you normally wouldn't get in something like this, right? Especially They'd be on a plane. Those back spasms. Right? Like, I, I think them just kind of being here for a couple of days, I don't want to say it gives them an advantage per se, right? But it, it removes some of the advantage of home court, I think. And New Orleans hasn't done a good job in the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans at all this year. So you look at this and yeah, New Orleans is probably like, man, I wish we were on the road or something like that a little bit here. So the Lakers are going to come in well rested versus a team that wouldn't be just because they've been here for a couple of days now. So what do you guys, both of you, I mean, because, you know, the Lakers played it. Terrible game on Friday. Managed to win against Memphis. Played a really bad game. And then looked like the, oh, you don't want to play those guys kind of version of the Lakers with a, you know, incredibly locked in AD, incredibly locked in LeBron, 17 assists. What did you take actually away from Sunday's game? Were you surprised at the result? Were you surprised at how lopsided it was? Either one of you. For me, no, in terms of lopsidedness, because it's very consistent with how these games have gone this season. The Lakers have a three-one uh, series match, uh, series record against the Pelicans, and the wins are on average by nearly twenty-six points. And there's one loss, and they lost by twenty, and obviously that loss counts. But there were a lot of extenuating circumstances. There was no D'Lo. Rui got hurt during the game. LeBron was playing sick. The Lakers were on the second end of a back-to-back, -back, and it was during that post IST period where the Lakers were at their absolute worst, which isn't to make excuses for it. Again, the Pelicans win matters, but the three wins that the Lakers had, the Pelicans had full strength rosters. They were on plenty of rest. Like the, the opposite type of extenuating circumstances didn't exist there for new Orleans. Also too, we might talk about this later in the show. The Lakers have had a strong ability to score in the paint against New Orleans, who have been one of the best paint defending teams in the league, that feels real as well. Yeah, when I, when I look at this one, right, in that game, in the final game of the regular season, like it, do, it doesn't really surprise me for whatever reason, and we can get into some of the matchups, I think there's obvious reasons why, and you mentioned some of them there, Andy, the, the Lakers match up really well with New Orleans. You know, it's kind of like a rock, paper, scissors thing. You know, the Pelicans are 5-0 and against the Kings. The Kings beat the Lakers. The Lakers beat the Pelicans here. And sometimes that's just how it goes. Sometimes there's just a matchup that for a variety of different reasons just doesn't work for your squad. And this Lakers one seems like it. I also think you saw kind of the experience of LeBron James in this game on Sunday as well, just coming in with the right mentality. He is who he is, right? He's one of the greatest of all times, one of the top two. And New Orleans hasn't kind of been in that, they don't, they don't have that mentality. And so they weren't really ready for him to come out, kind of take it to him. Same thing happened in the quarterfinal, the semifinal of the in-season tournament in Las Vegas as well. And New Orleans has struggled when they get basically punched in the mouth to really respond to that and answer that. And then it just, the, the Lakers essentially just ran away with it. So kind of having that experience in this team, you know, being a, a matchup struggle for New Orleans, I think part of that's the center position here. We'll probably get into Jonas Valanciunas, Larry Nates Jr. and all that stuff in a little bit. You know, they defend Zion Williamson really well too. That negates a lot of the strength of New Orleans. So you look at it and this is one where, you know, the per fan duel, the, uh, the Pelicans are favored minus one. But that means they would be underdogs on the on on the road in LA or underdogs on a neutral court too with all of it. So I don't think it's really surprising the way that final game shook out. Uh, let's get into the, the, some of these matchups, like you said, because in terms of looking ahead now to to tonight's game, like I, I, you mentioned, AD the Zion Lebron dynamic to me is 
fascinating because Zion really has, from the outside looking in at least, um, had a kind of a quietly nice season. Like for a guy who's been kind of shrouded in controversy, um, he's played really well. But this matchup in particular um, may not suit him all that well. So we'll get into all of that next. Locked on Lakers and Locked on Pelicans brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need an opportunity to get things off our chest, big items, little items. They can build up, and it's important to be able to talk with somebody unbiased in your life. For example, we do these shows for Lakers fans and Pelicans fans. We hope that there can be a stress relief from watching your favorite team, but I don't care how much you bleed your team's colors. We all have more pressing issues in our life. And it's important, again, to be able to get those things off your chest. And with those issues, therapy can be huge. I, I know from personal experience how much hair therapy helped me and my family during a really difficult period for us. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible, suited for your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. So, Jake, one of the things that we talk about a lot on our show is just the, the challenge that you have with LeBron as one of your core stars. And, like, statistically, LeBron in the second half of the season has been one of the best players in the NBA. Um, but, you know, it, it is a thing to try to manage 82 games with him. And, and how do you do it? And part of it is defensively because he can't lock in night to night. There are certain matchups that just, you know, really mobile wing guys and all that kind of stuff. But that said... Um, if you wanted to design, like LeBron's got to guard a star player on another team, you'd probably come up with a prototype of somebody like Zion, whose game is built a lot on strength and just being able to be stronger than the people that he's body up against. He's quicker than LeBron is now, but he ain't stronger. LeBron's got literally old man strength by NBA standards. When you look at this matchup and what Zion has done well this year, why he's had such a good season... What is he doing right? And then how does that potentially play in a matchup like this again? You know, I think when you look at it, right, like his strength is getting to the rim. It's getting to the rim and it's scoring at the rim. And, and, and I'll get into kind of a, a wrinkle he's added to that here in a second with all of it. But, you know, he wants to be able to either blow by you or kind of push you back. And there's very few people who are strong enough to keep up with him. This is a guy who can send like Rudy Gobert flying backwards like five feet when he kind of bodies him up. But LeBron, it, it, it's not just the strength, right? It's also the size too. Zion is undersized. He's 6'6", six, six, right? It feels like he's much bigger than that, but he but he isn't. And so a lot of length, which LeBron has, which Anthony Davis has too, is something that really gives him a lot of difficulty. It can mess up his touch scoring at the rim. But you also just have Le LeBron James, who's kind of committed to not letting him get by him. And that really limits what Zion can do. There isn't much else to his game, to be perfectly honest. He started to add in a bit of a mid-range jumper, but he's literally only done that for like the past week. And you saw it a lot in this game on Sunday where he rose up and tried to shoot it and it just wasn't falling, right? That's also not an efficient shot anyway in the NBA, right? The guy who scored, he scores 72% at the rim, a mid-range jumper like that's going to fall for, uh, you know, at a good rate, 50% of the time. That's a win for the Lakers every time that happens. So what you saw in this game and what you've seen teams do is just try and wall him off. And if you have a guy that can push the point of attack like LeBron James, you saw a lot of Anthony Davis kind of hanging out in the paint, right? Like that's the move is if he gets by LeBron, he's now got to run into Anthony Davis and you just live with anyone else making shots and beating you that way. But you can also still scheme some of those guys out. Look at Austin Reeves draped over CJ McCollum the majority of that game. That doesn't leave very many options, especially with Brandon Ingram, who's coming back from a knee injury. And that was his first game back in, you know, about a, uh, a little under a month. So if you can limit Zion Williamson, this Pelicans team just really struggles to score. And more than that, though, if you do it with the right kind of size and length, it's not just forcing him to miss a shot. It's, it's also he can't can't get those kickout passes to shooters in the corners and then the pelicans can work the ball around for an open three-pointer so that's kind of what you run into this and then you have the ultimate safety valve right in anthony davis you know who who should be a little bit in the running for defensive player of the year i think he's been that good with everything you know you have him right there and that presents a problem with it all i think 
What, what I think is really interesting about Zion heading into this game is there's a narrative I've heard about him that he's not considered a big game player. But what's interesting about that is he really hasn't played in any big games in right. the NBA. Like there's the IST semifinals between the Lakers and the Pelicans. Zion did not play well in that game. But beyond that, he has not been in the playoffs for the Pelicans. He's missed the play-in games or most of them for the Pelicans. So with that in mind, what are your expectations, if any, for Zion, given this opportunity to prove himself in a big stakes game? So, so I'm going to turn that back around on, on y'all here. Do you think he's capable of taking this game over? Do you think he can step in and go out and score 35, like off the jump, right? In form, getting to the rim and scoring kind of at will in this game. I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult. Broad, yeah, it's like broadly, yes, because he's had 30 point games and, you know, is scoring the ball well and has played really, but like, from a practical standpoint, I haven't seen it against the Lakers, and I just don't like those odds against LeBron. No, it's it's with what they're going to do to defend him, right? Like the the Lakers are going to let anyone anyone else anyone else beat them in this game, right? If CJ has thirty five to forty points and you all lose, I think you kind of go like, okay, that's that's how this happened, right? Like if Herb Jones scores twenty five points or Trey Murphy scores thirty or Jonas Valanciunas, like you live with that, and then you just go, okay, we we had the right game plan, and it's kind of process over results. Then even if the results didn't work out in our favor, so that's where what I think. You know, when we look at Zion, it's going to be those other guys that are going to need to step up early that maybe opens the game up for mm -hmm. Zion Williamson later. It's going to be hitting, you know, it's going to be CJ McCollum in, if the Lakers play drop coverage against him, shooting a three over that and doing it enough that they don't play drop coverage and it pulls someone out of the paint. It's going to be Brandon Ingram getting to his spot in the mid range and regularly hitting those shots where you go, okay, we actually have to devote a defender to him. Same for Trey, literally anybody, right? Well, I think this is one of those things where you you won't see Zion early and if he does have a good game it's going to be late and at that point the Pelicans maybe are starting to run away with it because everyone else has done their job early on at an exceptionally high level well, I can assure you they're going to play drop coverage because it's what they yeah. always do regardless of whether they should <laughs> or shouldn't you mentioned though before we go to the break BI do you think he will be physically capable by tonight to be able to do the things that they need from him forget whether or not he can do it against this defense just in a vacuum, do you think he'll actually be able? Yeah, you know, he he had a, a stretch in this game on Sunday where he looked good, where he was he hit that three right at the end of the mm -hmm. half or the quarter, I think it was. And then he had a couple of mid-rangers that were just falling. He was getting to his spots. He was feeling good. He was on a minutes restriction. I think that'll be eased up a little bit in this. Like if there was ever a time to be like, we got to we got to throw everything out there. It's certainly a game like this, I think. Um, he also takes a little bit when he comes back from a, an injury layoff to like shake off rust. So at least getting that one game out of the way, I think you'll see him be a little bit better. That's probably the guy that needs to score 35 right he needs to kind of be orchestrating the offense scoring early on to open things up and then hopefully you can close things out with zion williamson here so that's i think the way that we're going to kind of look at this i know the focus obviously should be on zion but i think early on in this game it's probably going to be on everyone else because the lakers are going to sell out to stop zion and when you have lebron you're very capable of doing that sort of thing all right, so let's let's go to the break here in a second because what, what i want to ask too is I, I, from from I, I had a couple things that I know worry me about what the Pelicans can do specifically around, you mentioned Trey Murphy and McCollum uh, and the Lakers' total inability over the course of the season to defend the three-point line. Um, yeah, I want to I get into a few things with you guys too. I have some right. questions for y'all here as well. Because I, I want to know where where you feel like this, this uh, matchup can turn for New Orleans because it has been so lopsided, generally yeah. speaking, in the Lakers' favor. And then fire away at us. We'll do all of that next. Locked on Lakers, locked on Pelicans, locked on everything, really, all uh, brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there as, as a player or as a fan. It's halftime. Scoreboard's not looking good. You feel low. You're not sure your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. You lift your head up and you say to yourself, it's time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The Smash mobile game Monopoly Go. 
lets you compete against your friends and get to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much you can do. You can play countless dynamic monopoly boards. You make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. That sounds like fun. You charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends, uh, the ones that you're not smashing their properties with a wrecking ball, to crack open community chests in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now for free at the App Store or Google Play. Again, Monopoly Go, download it for free now at the App Store or Google Play. So where do you want to start? Do you want to start by sh shooting some questions at us, or do you want to answer this three point thing? No. So so let let me let me go to you guys here. I just I just talked a bunch. I need a little bit of a break here and everything. So you know, looking at this game, you know, Andy, you talked about the points in the paint here. Is that basically what the Lakers are going to try and do again? It seems like a lot of just LeBron James driving, kicking it to a baseline cut, or the guy in the dunker spot. And you know how how does a team like the Pelicans need to try and counter that? Because to me, that's the first thing they need to try and resolve with this game well i mean i definitely think they're going to be trying to do it because they they scored 68 in sunday's win over the pelicans which is an insane number except they also had 68 in the 139 122 win uh leading up to this one they've scored at least 50 in all four of these matchups in the paint and the the one in the ist they only had 52 but keep in mind the starters other than AD all played less than 24 minutes. So I feel like if they had played four quarters worth of real basketball, it would have been higher. And it's an area where the Lakers love to live. They're often at their best. The best way, I think, for the Pelicans to go about stopping them is to avoid their own turnovers. Like the Pelicans need to do a really good job taking care of the ball because the Lakers, their offense has gotten better, much better over the course of this year in terms of half court or just overall functionality, but they are still a deadly team when they're in transition. Um, they, they've become very good at, you know, guys cutting off ball, you know, finding good, good places to go where you, you know, hit ahead passes, things like that. You know, LeBron in transition is obviously still incredibly scary for other defenders. They've got, they've got guys who are very creative at finding um, their teammates on the run and the Lakers' defense is often, frankly, just at its best through creating chaos via turnovers. So I think that's the best way for New Orleans to defend their own paint is to protect the ball. Yeah, I, I look at it too, and I, I think like the turnover thing is was the first thing I was going to go to as well because you're just giving nobody stops LeBron going downhill. Like it was getting even if you other than willing, the refs. That's right. Unless you're willing yeah, I to make said it. The business decision. Oh boy, <laughs> the comments. Well, I'm just on trying to piss off your fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh unless, boy. Unless you're, to make, unless you're willing to make that business decision in a playoff play in game, you probably would. But even then, it's not going to help you. I mean, like he's just too big and too strong and still too explosive um, once he's moving downhill to really do anything with. Um, and then the other, you know, the, it also opens up turnovers. Open up the Lakers not just to score inside, but also get to the free throw line. I mean, they win by by you know paint points and free throws and then the alternative where i think you know i would try to you know you limit your turnovers and then get them in the half court and then make them make shots like three pointing three point shooting is no longer a glaring weakness with the lakers like they you look at the percentages particularly you know maybe about a, you know 35 40% of the season to now like they've been a very competent three point shooting team. They don't take a lot of them though. And I feel like where the Lakers are at their worst is when they start to get away from being able to get to the rim and all that stuff and get a little three point happy. Even if they are capable of hitting more threes than they used to and hitting them more consistently, it does kind of get them away from their strengths, I think. So, you know, it's not a foolproof plan because Russell, Reeves, LeBron, they've got you know, Rui. competent shooters now. Rui Hachimura has been well over 40% for most of the year. Um, they've got good, competent shooters out there. But if you can get them off to one of these like two for 14 starts, which happens to any even good three point shooting teams, it happens to, I feel like that starts to tilt their offense in ways that become more difficult 
for the Lakers to overcome. That's where I would start. But if you don't, if you're turning the ball over, um, it doesn't matter. And the Lakers, you know, carved up the Pelicans in yeah, you know, all the courts in the in open court, in half court. Um, you know, if LeBron is as dialed in as a passer as he was, and the Lakers are actually moving, um, there's not a lot you can do because LeBron's just that good. No, I, I wonder if they're going to try and kind of press him a little bit more at the point of attack. I think he had 15 assists by halftime. Was that the right number? 13, 14, 13. 13. It was like it was, a, it was an 13. insanely high number. <laughs> only 13 here. That, and, the, and the Lakers that scored New Orleans points in the paint at halftime. I think it was 50 to 12 was the number. Something like yep. that. Like something kind of absurd, right? Like they, they need to try and take away those drives to the basket because that's what kind of carved them up. And so I'm sure they're going to kind of throw a different strategy out there. But then, you I, look, I don't know what it is with, with D'Angelo Russell playing against New Orleans, right? He's 3-0 and against them this season. The one game he didn't play is the one that New Orleans won by 20. Like, you get those kind of players here, and it's just a bit of a difference maker for him. Like, Austin Reeves felt like he couldn't miss in that game. Some of the other guys couldn't miss. Even when LeBron kind of got to the rim and just kicked it out. And so New Orleans really needs to try and figure out what to do defensively that's going to work. This is the sixth best defense, you know, in the NBA this year, and right. they looked pitiful against the Lakers. Well, I think you know the other thing about LeBron versus Zion is it's not just the physical the physicality and all that stuff. It's also the intellect. Like LeBron yeah. understands everything about Zion's game as well as Zion does, if not better. And he's going to have a counter to that. And so, you know, the it's it's going to be hard for the Pelicans, I think, to come up with a defensive strategy that LeBron will be fooled by, but the rest of the Lakers potentially could be. Um, you know, there, well, there's it, something to be said for that. It's funny, Jake. You mentioned D'Angelo Russell going off on the Pelicans this season. I was thinking about, you know, in terms of X factors for each team, and I'd be curious who you consider the X factor for the Pelicans. But for the Lakers, I think generally, but specifically in this game, it's either D'Angelo Russell or Rui Hachimura because the the Pelicans they're they're a weird team in that they're not a small team, but I don't think their size matches up well with the Lakers' size and with the amount of size that's required. I mean, this happens with a lot of teams, much less the Pelicans. The amount of size that's required to deal with AD and LeBron it often leaves Rui as a walking mismatch, and he is really, really good at utilizing his size and his athleticism in those type of matchups. He's also become just extremely good at moving off the ball, cutting along the baseline, like relocating into open space. But the biggest X factor on this team is D'Angelo Russell. And when D'Lo's off, the Lakers can still win, but it becomes a lot harder. When the Lakers when Delo's on, the Lakers are sometimes unbeatable. And how New Orleans is going to go about figuring out their best perimeter defenders, what to do with them, because a guy like Herb Jones, he's going to be giving up a lot of size against uh, LeBron. Do you put him on Delo and try to mess up, you know, Delo from a shooting perspective, from a play, uh, playmaking perspective? But then you lose that one perimeter defender that maybe could be disruptive against LeBron or Rui. Like, you know, what do you do with Bi? I think that's going to be really interesting in this game because those are the two guys that if they go off, I think the Pelicans are likely done. It, look, D, I think D'Angelo Russell is the X factor for the Lakers in this, right? He's averaging 21 points per game against the Pelicans this season. In the three games that he's played, he just hit five threes. The previous game, he hit six, and then he was two of five in their first matchup this season in the in-season tournament where probably would have hit more if he had played more minutes than what he did, right? So, like, that guy in the shooting and the way he kind of bends the court, I think, is really important for them that even if you slow down LeBron James, you've got that guy you've still got to deal with. And it's funny, like I look at it and, and you know, I, I was thinking like, well, maybe there are some percentages here because I look at the three point shooting and you mentioned Murphy, you mentioned McCollum and guys like that. And, and you know, Herb Jones are all very competent three point shooters. Or, the or first or half Sunday, I was like, well, the Pelicans get Herb Jones some help. Like, <laughs> <going nuts. laughs> But it's like you look at it and I went back and looked and like 
there are like you know, v- uh, Murphy's volume is down a little bit against the Lakers this year, but percentage wise, he's fine. And McCollum is fine. The, the lowest I think is Murphy of the three of the is Murphy at 40%. So it's not like they haven't been hitting shots. And so that was the first place I looked to see if maybe there was some statistical variance that could come through. The biggest reason that I think the, the Pelicans struggle, like Andy said, like that size doesn't work uh, as effectively against the Lakers is there's no corresponding guard. I mean, CJ's a great player, but he's not De'Aaron Fox breaking you down in that way. He's not Jamal Murray, where you combine the really quick guard that the Lakers don't have the capacity to handle. Austin Reeves is quick enough to guard CJ. You know, right. he's going to get loose. He's going to score. He's a really good player. But, he, you know, Austin Reeves is not quick enough to guard De'Aaron Fox. Nobody is. But, like, and so I think that's the part of New Orleans' offense that to me takes a vulnerable Lakers defense and, doesn't doesn't throw off those other mismatches. Doesn't it allows you to have that eighty to roam and either it's against Larry Nance or if Valanciunas stays on the floor, great. But now you're you know you're you're leaving yourself vulnerable on the other end, and I think the Lakers would take that. Um, it allows Rui to kind of hide on players. It just when when you don't have that really explosive guard to break down the Lakers defense, because then it just completely collapses. Um, that I see is the biggest vulnerability. I'm not sure that New Orleans has a fix for that. No, they, they have a couple of problems that they don't have a fix for. I think not having a player like that, kind of like a slashing guard, is is something that they're definitely missing. They have an issue with the center position, right? It's like kind of bi, correct? It, it's kind of bi in Zion is is who does right. it, and that's kind of who their point guards are, right? They run it through them, but you know that's you put LeBron on one of them and it kind of negates some of that, I think, right? Like that's where it, it's kind of a weird makeup of a team. And then they're, you know, they don't have an answer at the center position, right? We saw a lot of Larry Nance Jr. in this game or in that last game. And like, that wasn't it. They barely played Jonas Valanciunas because if they do play Jonas Valanciunas and just try and run their offense through him, which they've done at times, the Lakers aren't going to double Jonas Valanciunas. They'll let him go one-on-one with Anthony Davis. And the whole point of running your offense through him is he can draw double teams from some opponents. They're not going to do that here so there's some just holes on the pelicans that they don't have an answer for and maybe brian what they need because you just you wanted to ask about this is the three-point shooting with some of these guys and maybe that's going to be the ultimate difference maker yeah i mean look at me there's the 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 capabilities are there um and if they have you know hot shooting night in the lakers look hollinger over at the athletic picked the pelicans to win this game not sure if that makes you feel better or worse i'm not Um, sure (laughs) all right prediction time guys uh we'll start with andy What what do you think happens here I think the Lakers are going to end up winning this game. They, I just think the matchups work very well in the Lakers' favor. And who knows? For, good news for the Pelicans. According to Jake, if the Kings end up winning this game between Golden State, five and zero oh against them. <laughs> that's a really good. Thing. Like everybody may end up getting what they want in the end. And I got nothing against the Pelicans. I would love to see them in the playoffs. I'm a big Bi guy, and Larry Nance Jr. All former Lakers there. Um, Look, I I think I would get run out of my show if I didn't take the Pelicans here. I will say this. Will Green's been, their head coach has been under a little bit of heat this season. I don't think he's one of the elite coaches in the league at all here. (laughs) I don't know about that, actually. I don't know about that. Um, But one thing that like I've seen him do. Lakers fans are salivating for Willie Green or (laughs) really anyone. Anybody else, right? Anyone. Which is ironic because we have a guy whose last name is Ham. You'd think they'd be salivating for Ham, but they're not. (laughs) like ultimate dad joke there yeah. um I, I do think i've seen them make some defensive adjustments and offensive adjustments in these kind of like quick turnaround games where you play that same opponent soon after and knowing the stakes at this i feel that they're going to at least be much more competitive than they were on sunday maybe it feels like they're due to get a home win so i'm going to take the pelicans here i think this game is gonna be a lot closer than the other ones i i expect I, i'd be surprised not shocked just based on the track record, but surprised if the Lakers have another one of these, they're up by 15 and it's basically 15 to 25, the rest of the game. Um, but I do think they're going to, until I see the Pelicans win against a full strength Lakers squad, I look at this the same way as I do Lakers versus Kings, as I did Lakers versus Clippers for a long time. And frighteningly enough, how we all kind of view Lakers versus Denver, which is a problem for another podcast. Um, but I, so I do think the Lakers are going to win. I do, but I think it'll be a, a significantly more competitive game. Um, this is fun. May, who knows? Maybe we'll do this again for the Western Conference Finals. There we go. I like that. It's idea. possible. 
It's we'd all be happy then, right? Yeah. Like we'd all be happy if that was the case. Tremendous content. Uh, locked on Lakers and uh, locked on Pelicans. You can find all of these things on our respective YouTube channels. Leave questions, leave comments, uh, and uh, Jake, enter each other's shows. Yes, that's yeah. right. Go comment talk, on everybody here and smack. everything. Um, this is fun, and I'm glad yeah. that your your audience will actually see this one. It, the other one was on there too. It ended up getting posted. It's just like the Lakers heavy version of it. We're we very great balance Jake. here. Thank you. Yeah, you're All both right, welcome. We'll see everybody uh, tomorrow.